everybody and welcome back to another Wheel of Time video. I'm back from my vacation and back from a little vacation from my vacation, uh, but I'm back at it with another character analysis video. Today we're going to tackle one of the most polarizing characters in the Wheel of Time, and that's the character of Egwene Alvere. Before we get into that though, let me quickly shout out the channel's sponsor. This video is brought to you by Audible.com, but we will talk more about them later. Let's throw up a spoiler warning for the video. This video is going to carry a spoiler rating of red, with spoilers all the way through a memory of light, and there are going to be some heavy spoilers. So if you haven't finished the series, watch this video at your own risk. You have been warned. So as with all of my character analysis videos, I've broken down Egwene's character into 10 different sections to analyze the different aspects of who she is and what she does. Those sections are as follows. History before the story, actions during the story, appearance, personality, special abilities, notable possessions, relationships, greatest moments, what happens after the story, and then overall impact and role on the story. And then at the very end of the video, I'll give you my thoughts overall on Egwene's character and whether or not I thought she was executed well. And we'll also briefly talk about uh, what's going on with the Amazon Studios television adaptation of The Wheel of Time in regards to Egwene's character. So let's get started with the analysis. Egwene was born in 981 of the New Age to Bran Alvere and his wife Marin Alvere. Bran is the town mayor of Emmonsfield, and he was the town's only innkeeper. Now, Egwene was born the youngest of five children. She has four older sisters named Berowyn, Elisa, Aline, Elaine, and Louise. As Egwene was growing up, she took a liking to reading books that were in her father's collection in his inn. He had a small library, and she used to read the books there. She's very strongly driven to learn things. And that really started with reading these books. When Egwene was nine years old, she comes down with something called breakbone fever, which is normally a fatal ailment. The wisdom at the time, Doral Baran, was unable to help Egwene, but Nynaeve Almira, the wisdom's apprentice at the time, was able to heal her through the use of the One Power, although she was not aware of that at the time. Now, right before the start of Eye of the World in 998 of the New Age, while she was still 16, Egwene was finally permitted by the Women's Circle to braid her hair, which is a sign of adulthood in the Two Rivers. Now, Egwene is one of the main characters of the series, getting the third largest word count among any character, just behind Rand and Perrin. So there's going to be a ton to go over for her in the story. I'm going to do my best to summarize her actions, but we will need to be super, super broad here. Otherwise, the video would be like two hours long. So as the story begins, Egwene is serving as the apprentice to Nynaeve Almira, the current wisdom of the village. After the Trolloc attack on Winter Night, she assists Nynaeve in treating the injured. Now she puzzles out that Rand, Perrin, and Matt are leaving with Moraine and Lan, and she just basically pushes herself in on that and tries to leave with them, and then they flee the shadow spawn on the two rivers that are pursuing them. Now during a short stop after leaving the two rivers, Moraine explains to Egwene that she can channel and begins to instruct Egwene on the basics of channeling the One Power. When Nynaeve finally catches up with the group in Berlon, Egwene is caught between her old teacher in Nynaeve and her new teacher in Moraine as they kind of argue with each other. Eventually, Nynaeve decides to accompany the group to Egwene's relief. Now, they're forced to flee Berlon after being chased by a Murdral, and Moraine does the illusion thing to get past the White Cloaks that were blocking the exit. Eventually, they're forced to take refuge in Shadar Logoth, where the group is eventually split up, and Egwene ends up washed up on the opposite shore of the river with Perrin. Now, they meet Elias Machira, the Wolves, a group of Tinkers, and they're eventually captured by the White Cloaks at an abandoned steading. They are beaten, uh, and they're about to be taken for trial, but Nynaeve, Moraine, and Lan rescue them. Now they arrive in Camelon, and they find Matt and Rand, and the entire party sets off for Faldara through the ways, and they eventually make their way to the Blight and the Eye of the World. Now Egwene is there when Balthamel and Agenor confront the group. Uh, she charges at Balthamel as he holds Nynaeve, but she's basically tackled by Rand, and he's trying to save her. After Rand returns from his confrontations with Agenor and Ishamayel, Egwene is there with Moraine, and she's one of the few at this point that knows that Rand can channel the One Power. They return to Faldara, and Egwene stays there for roughly a month, meeting with Pot and Fane regularly, who's in the fortress prisons. She remembers him from her youth, and she's trying to bring out his humanity, but that comes back to bite her. So the Amarlin seat, Swan Sanche, arrives, and Egwene is attacked in the dungeons while visiting Pot and Fane when the Trollocs attack the keep and the Horn of the Lear is stolen. But she survives the attack. Uh, she leaves for Tarvalon with the party of the Aes Sedai and begins to receive instruction on channeling before arriving in the White Tower. Now, Egwene spends time in the tower learning to channel before she is taken by Leandrin through the ways to Tomon Head, 
under the guise of helping Rand. In actuality, she hands them over to the Shan Chan, and Egwene is taken captive as a Damani. She fights back, but she is subdued by the Idom. Now, she's essentially enslaved, and although she's allowed visits from men, she feels more and more hopeless in her position as they eventually tell her she's going to be sent over to the Shan Chan continent. Nynaeve and Elaine Tracan stage a rescue and successfully free her, while simultaneously Matt, Rand, and Perrin come searching for the Horn, and the White Cloaks converge on the town at Falma. A uh, great battle ensues. Matt ends up blowing the Horn of Belir, summoning the heroes of the Horn, and they defeat the Shan Chan. Egwene returns to the tower with Varen, Nynaeve, Elaine, and Matt, who's on the brink of death from his exposure to the Shadar Logoth dagger. When they arrive, Egwene is disciplined for leaving the tower, but is tasked by the Armalins to seek out and find the Black Aja. During this time, she also witnesses Matt being healed, and she is raised to the Accepted. So Egwene also has a strong inclination that she may be a dreamer, or at least she's told so by the Aes Sedai, Everyone's kind of suspecting that she might be. Uh, Varen Mathwin gives her a ring that allows her to enter the world of dreams and hopes that will help her in her search for the Black Aja. Now, the search for the Black Aja leads her, Nynaeve, and Elaine to leave Tarvalin and head for Tyr. After a few stops along the way, when their boat runs aground and they're captured by dark friends and subsequently rescued by the Aeel that they end up befriending, they arrive in Tyr. They search for the Black Aja with the help of a thief catcher named Julian Sandar. But he eventually betrays them under Leandrin's compulsion, and Egwene is captured by the Black Aja along with Elaine and Nynaeve. She's held in the dungeons in the Stone of Tear, really as a trap for Rand. Egwene is able to start their escape by actually entering the World of Dreams and shielding the Black Aja sisters there, but also with the help of Matt, who breaks into the stone to rescue them which she really doesn't give him credit for until much later on. Now that same night, Rand takes the Stone of Tear with the Aeel, and Egwene stays within the stone and interrogates the captured Black Aja sisters. While Rand debates on what he should do next, Elaine, Nynaeve, and Egwene all do the same. Egwene uses the World of Dreams to attempt to find out their next steps, and discovers that they should go to Tanchico in search of the Black Aja. Also though, while in the World of Dreams, she stumbles upon Amis, who is an Aeol wise one who tells her to come to the Aeol ways to be trained as a dreamwalker. During this time, Egwene tells Rand that she doesn't love him, which is something that he seems to have a mutual feeling about. Rand announces that he's going to go to the waste, and Egwene accompanies them as Rand takes the entire group via portal stone right to the outskirts of Roydeon. Egwene begins her training with the wise ones, which is sometimes pretty harsh, but she grows in strength uh, greatly within the world of dreams. After Rand reveals the secret of the Aeol to all of their population and unites a couple clans behind him, Egwene stays with the Aeol in Roydeon. As the Shido travel to Kyrian, Egwene travels with Rand's gathered army in pursuit and stays in contact with Elaine and Nynaeve through the use of the World of Dreams. Egwene agrees to help Rand fight in the Battle of Kyrian with the One Power and helps assist in the defeat of the Shido. Egwene later accompanies Rand and Moraine to the docks in Kyrian and is injured badly by Lanfear before Moraine tackles her into the storeway. As Egwene recovers from her injury, she continues to enter the World of Dreams despite being told not to by the Wise Ones, where she meets Elaine and Nynaeve and keeps them informed on what Rand is doing. Egwene wanders the city of Kyrian during this time, and she encounters Gawain, and they kind of rekindle their relationship from before when she was in the tower. Gawain has just arrived with the White Tower delegation. Egwene gathers information for Rand, also while kissing Gawain, uh, and they're basically courting, I guess. As Egwene arrives and speaks with Rand, though, from telling him that she had met Gawain, the White Tower emissaries arrive unexpectedly to surprise Rand, and he hides her with a weave of illusion while he meets with them. She warns him not to trust them and to not underestimate Aes Sedai, but he seemingly blows her off. Later, when she's officially allowed to return to the World of Dreams uh, by the Wise Ones, she meets with the Rebel Tower Aes Sedai, and they summon her to Saladar. Before she's to leave, she admits to the Wise Ones that she was actually not an Aes Sedai, and that she had entered the dream without their permission. She asks them to meet her toe, and they proceed to help her by basically beating the shit out of her with paddles. Uh, is Hey, it's their culture, right? Once they've decided that she no longer has any toe, she uses the World of Dreams to enter in the flesh and arrives in Saladar in just one night. Once she arrives, she's raised her Amalon seat by the rebels as they wanted someone close to Rand that was strong in the power and that could be controlled, or at least in their own minds. Egwene raises Elaine, Nynaeve, Theodrin, and Phelan to Aes Sedai, and sends Elaine and Nynaeve off to find the Bowl of the Winds in Ebudar to fix the weather. Matt, who arrives at basically the same time there to rescue Egwene, is also sent by Egwene to assist. Egwene takes over control of Mogidian's Idom, but Mogidian is soon released by Halima. Egwene uses Matt's army, the Band of the Red Hand, to leverage against the Hall of the Tower, to get the Aes Sedai to leave Saladar, which is the first of her strong political moves that strengthen her hold on the Amarlin Seed in reality. She also has Swan arrange for Loghain's escape 
so that he could go to Ram for the amnesty that Ram had offered to men that could channel. Egwene continues to gain a larger and larger following as she forces various Aes Sedai to swear fealty through political means and some coercion, to put it lightly. Egwene cements her control over the rebel Aes Sedai by deftly maneuvering and declaring war on Elida. Egwene cements her control over the rebel Aes Sedai by deftly maneuvering them to declaring war on Elida, which gives her war powers that puts a stop to any of the bickering and fights for authority that she had been dealing with. She forces the rebel forces to travel to Tarvalin, and they begin their siege of the White Tower. Now the siege keys around turning the great harbor chains in Tarvalin and to Quindiar to prevent the island from being resupplied and forcing a surrender. Egwene is forced to help with the task, and in the process of doing so, she is captured by the White Tower sisters after she was betrayed by someone in the camp. Egwene is taken to the White Tower. She is reduced to novice again. She's also given various doses of fork root to dull her ability to channel. Elida thinks that she's cowed, but she begins to use her position in the tower to sow mistrust for Elida's reign, and she builds up a lot of credibility with Aes Sedai within the tower. Egwene essentially practices a civil disobedience strategy and is beaten heavily by the Mistress of Novices, but she continues on, and she builds more and more credibility. Egwene is eventually summoned to serve Elida in front of the sisters, and then they openly argue, uh, and Elida beats her with the power. Now, Egwene is thrown in the prison cells, but she later learns that Elida's actions resulted in a censure from the Hall of the Tower, and Egwene is free to go. She's visited by Varen, who has returned to the tower, and Varen tells her basically, hey, I'm Black Aja, and proceeds to reveal everything that she knows about the Black, including the names of its many members, before she dies. Now, Egwene is able to tell Swan a few of these names right before the Shan Chan attack the White Tower while she's in the World of Dreams, but then Egwene is woken up to the Shan Chan basically raiding the tower. Egwene, seeing that the tower is not being properly defended, gathers novices together, teaches them to link with the power, and then uses their power to retrieve Vora Sa'angrial, which is in the White Tower storeroom. She uses this and her circle of novices to single-handedly fight off the Shan Chan attack. She passes out from exhaustion after driving them off, rescues from the tower by Swan, Gawain, and Gareth Bryn. When she awakens, she reveals the remaining Black Aja in the camp, and they are executed. Not long after, the Tower Aes Sedai approach her and ask to raise her to Amarlin Sea, reuniting the tower. Not long after, she is visited in the White Tower by Rand, who has just ascended Dragon Mount and has been up there turning into Zen Rand. He informs her that he is planning on breaking the seals on the Dark One's prison in one month, and that then he will go to Sheol Ghul and repair the boar. She disagrees with this course of action strongly, and sets to gathering world leaders at the fields of Marilor to oppose Rand. Gwyn sets a trap for the remaining Black Aja in the tower with the World of Dreams, and sets, also sets a trap to, to confront Masana, who is masquerading as an Aes Sedai somewhere in the tower. After hosting a meeting of all the female groups of channelers in the Westlands, Egwene's plan is essentially to bait the Black Aja and Masana into attacking, and it works. Egwene, along with the other female channelers, fight off and defeat the Black Aja, and Egwene herself defeats Masana by breaking her mind in a short duel. The Black Aja had been prevented from leaving the White Tower due to Perrin bringing a Dream Spike there in his fight with Slayer. Also during this fight, Egwene wakes up and discovers that Gawain had been defending her bedside from Shan Chan Blood Knives, and he was near death. She quickly bonds him her warder and marries him not long after to everyone's delight. A month later, at the fields of Marilor, Egwene is present when Elaine discovers that Camelon has been invaded by Trollocs. Egwene gives what assistance she can and prepares to meet Rand the following day. She opposes Rand's plans and the dragon piece vehemently, and the talks almost break apart when Moraine arrives, freshly rescued by Matt and Tom. Moraine calms the people in attendance and convinces Egwene to sign the dragon's piece, with some modifications. Egwene also agrees that Elaine will command the armies of the Light, and Egwene and the White Tower are assigned to the battlefield in Kandor. The White Tower forces do very well against the Shadowspawn army there, and they have absolute and complete control over that battlefield. When it's beginning to look like they might utterly defeat the Shadowspawn army completely, large gateways open, and the, and the Sharn army led by Demondred rush the field and demolish a good amount of the White Tower forces. Egwene is caught behind the lines, but eventually escapes. She meets with Tuon and forges a small piece that helps bring the Shan Chan into the battle. Eventually, it's realized that the great generals have been compromised with compulsion, and Egwene helps put Matt in charge of the battle because he cannot be controlled by compulsion due to his medallion. They all move to the fields of Marilor for a final stand, and Egwene goes with the army. Gawain decides at this point to try to end things with Demondred and puts the three blood knife rings on that he had recovered from the Shan Chan assassins, and goes to fight Demondred. He is killed, clearly, and almost puts Egwene into a rage where she ends up killing herself. She ends up recovering, 
She bonds Agin and Tamarath as her warder, and then she takes Vora Sa'angriel and goes back to the battlefield. There, Mahale, who's formerly Mazrum Taim, is using Balefire to just wipe out uh, the armies of the light. She fights him, and she pulls every ounce of the power that she can through the Sa'angriel. She comes up with a weave that she calls the Flame of Tarvalin, which is able to heal the damage to the world that Balefire was causing. Using this weave and the incredible amount of power that she was pulling through the Sa'angriel, she is able to kill almost all of the Shar Channelers, the Dreadlords with Taim, and Mazrum Taim himself. In one stroke, she is able to wipe out most of the Channelers for the Shadow. However, she drew on more of the one power that she could safely hold, and she not only is about to burn herself out, but she burns herself away and she dies. Her last moments in the series come as her soul speaks to Rand, telling him to let others sacrifice as well. So yeah, that's a legit ton of stuff to cover. I'm sorry that I left some of your favorite parts out. I know I did. Uh, but what can I say? She has a lot of content. But if you want to catch up on every little thing that she did in the books, I would suggest a reread, and I suggest you do it with the channel sponsor, Audible.com. Audible is the largest supplier of audiobooks in the world, and they have all of the Wheel of Time books, which are masterfully done by Michael Kramer and Kate Redding. You can listen to the Wheel of Time, or you can pick up one of the millions of other books that they have on there. One I recently downloaded is called Relentless by Tim Grover, who was the trainer for Michael Jordan and a bunch of other really famous people, and it talks about all of the successful people that he's worked with, and what makes them different and how you can apply some of those concepts in your life. I love the book, highly recommend it. There's tons of other great ones on there. Here's the better news. Because you're one of my viewers, Audible is going to give you a free audiobook. All you have to do is head to www.audibletrial.com forward slash nabless and get the free trial. They're gonna give you a free book even if you decide not to keep the service, but honestly, it's cheap and why wouldn't you? Because you get a new audiobook every month. Again, www.audibletrial.com forward slash nabless. So back to the video. Now, Egwene is fairly short. Uh, she's only around five foot three, and she's said to have a very, very slim body. Uh, she has brown hair and really large uh, brown eyes. Most people that describe Egwene describe her as being very, very beautiful. Now, in regards to her personality, Egwene is extremely determined and incredibly smart. She has a natural curiosity to her that she needs to know how things work, and she really strives to understand all sides of things. Egwene is very clever. She often observes situations that others might not. She can come across as a bit of a know-it-all, even if she does, in fact, know it all. Like a lot of the people from the Two Rivers, Egwene can be very stubborn and can be very overbearing towards those that get in the way of what she knows to be true. Egwene strives to be excellent at everything she does, and she often achieves this, but with frequent success comes the trap of always believing that you know best, and this sometimes comes back to get her. Egwene was one of the strongest female channelers in the series, not only in raw strength, but also in the number of specific talents that she possessed and her unique training. She studied under a number of various channeling organizations and was forced to her full potential by the Shan Champ. Her raw strength in the one power is an eight plus five, which puts her near the top of the female Aes Sedai in power level and just under the Forsaken in strength. She is strong in all five powers, especially Earth, which is considered quite rare among female channelers. She is adept at molding and shaping rock, finding ores at a distance, and forming and creating Quindiar. She's also very skilled at splitting her weaves multiple ways, something that other channelers tend to struggle with when they start splitting them too many different directions. Additional to her channeling abilities, Egwene is one of the strongest dreamwalkers in the series. She has the ability to access the world of dreams innately, without the use of traveling or Terangriol, and she has a high degree of control over the world of dreams despite her very young age and relatively short training. She's able to access other people's dreams, pull others into the dream. She has absolute dominance over the world of dreams itself, like the physical world of it. And she has the mental fortitude uh, to go against such experienced and dangerous opponents as like the Forsaken in the world of dreams itself. Now, Gwaine has never really had anything notable that she keeps with her for long periods of time, but she does use several items over the course of the series. Towards the beginning of the series, she possesses a ring Terangriol that lets you access the world of dreams that was given to her by Varen, 
and she uses it when she first starts accessing the World of Dreams. She later stops using this because she can access the World of Dreams on her own, and so she gives it to Nynaeve and Elaine. The other major object that she uses and possesses is Vora Sa'angrial. She uses this in the defense of the White Tower and at the last battle to great effect. Although it's technically not hers, we do see her use it more than anyone else. Now, Gwen has a lot of relationships within the story, but for sake of time, I want to narrow it down and focus on a few of them. Let's start with my least favorite of her relationships, but it literally has to be mentioned, and that is her friendship, then courtship, then short marriage to the most annoying Tricand, and that is saying a lot. Elaine's relationship with Gawain starts with their time in the White Tower, and it really grows when they're both in Kyrian before Rand's kidnapping. To me, I never really felt like they made sense for each other. And Egwene being smitten with him just seems very out of character for a person of her focus and drive. He's a whiny, self-centered person, and it just never felt real to me that she would like him. His attempt at killing Demondred and subsequent failure drives Egwene into a rage that almost kills her, and it just seems like someone as careful and calculating as Egwene wouldn't be so love-struck over someone who seems so much her inferior in so many ways. Not to mention that's one of her best friend's brothers. Quick question for the crowd. How many of you all would be cool with your best friend making sexy time with one of your siblings? That's what I thought. The next relationship I want to look at is her relationship with Nynaeve. This is a relationship that evolves over time and one that I really enjoy watching change. At the beginning of the story, Egwene very much looks up to Nynaeve as the village wisdom and the person that she's apprenticed to, basically. She follows Nynaeve's lead and sees her as a leader. As Egwene begins to grow away from being a small town country girl and into a more powerful channeler and Aes Sedai type, she gains confidence and begins to see herself as an equal with Nynaeve. And of course, this causes a conflict. Now, eventually Nynaeve feels a shift uh, as Egwene is a stronger channeler as that she can channel without a block. Uh, Egwene is also stronger in the world of dreams, and Nynaeve struggles with this power change between the two of them. Much later in the novels, Nynaeve comes into her own, and in a small degree, seizes back the moral authority by saying that she would choose land and helping people over the tower, and Nynaeve becomes a leader in Egwene's eyes once more, although they really are almost equals at this point. I could really spend an entire video breaking down that relationship, but I always loved it. The last relationship I want to mention is that with Swan. Swan is very much a mentor to Egwene, and she gives her most of the necessary information that she really needs to become the Amarlin after being set up as a figurehead. Egwene is very naturally intelligent, but so is Swan. And her skill at manipulation and politics very certainly helped Egwene achieve what she did. And really, without Swan, Egwene would not have arrived where she did. So Gwen literally has tons of great moments in the series, and so rather than mention them all, I'll mention a few of my favorites. A couple of my favorite Egwene Gwen moments are most certainly her captivity in the White Tower, and then subsequently her fight with the Shan Chan. I love how Egwene undermines Elida's rule from within by sticking to her principles and honor, while very much showing that she is the right person to actually lead the White Tower. She gained respect and achieved leadership not because she had power, but because she deserved it. And then her fight and bravery in handling the Sean Chain attack on the White Tower was just badass behavior, and I enjoy reading it every time. If you really want to see a deep dive into some of Egwene's great moments, Wheel Talk with Rakapa Sedai has an absolutely hilarious video uh, with a outstanding ranking system that is the most detailed ranking system I've ever seen to rank things. Highly recommend you check that video out. I will have it linked in the video below. If you are not following Rakapa Sedai and Wheel Talk, you are missing out one of the best new channels, best new pieces of content on the Wheel of Time on the internet. There you go. Check it out. Well, sorry to break it to you folks, but there is no after the story for Egwene. But I love the way that she went out. I thought her death was impactful, and I'm sure that she would be remembered as one of the greatest Amarlins who ever lived, simply by her actions in reuniting the White Tower, and then fighting in the last battle. Now, one could hypothetically say here, what would happen if Egwene had lived? Now, this might be a topic for another video, which maybe I will do. But I would like to think that actually Egwene made a better wartime Amarlin than she would have governing in peace. I just think that she lacked the experience, but this is something we can probably get into in another video. I'm curious what you all would think about that. Egwene is one of the major, major characters within the Wheel of Time. 
Uh, she's essentially a female parallel to Rand in terms of her rise to power and the challenges that she faces along the way as she gets to that power. She is powerful, not just in her abilities, but also in her authority, in her political skills. She's absolutely pivotal in the victory of the light and her bravery and power would long be remembered in the fourth age. So what do I think of Egwene's character? So this is a tough one. I think she's divisive to most people because she has a very polarizing attitude towards people in the series. She can come across very patronizing and very much like a know-it-all. She treats some of the other characters like they are complete idiots at times, and she's really, really stubborn in admitting when she's wrong, particularly with Matt. Now, on the flip side of that, she's a badass awesome character. So. That leads into this next part, and it's a common argument that I see fans make against Egwene in her character, is that she's a Mary Sue. Uh, I'm not going to get too deep into the topic in this video, because I'm going to be releasing another video where we get more in-depth on this question. But there are some fairly good arguments to be made that Egwene seems to be able to do things that just don't really make sense for a character of her age and experience to be able to do. Really, just for the sake of plot, is the argument. Now, I don't know that I necessarily agree with that, but I know many feel that way about her. So like I said, I'll be tackling this topic in a future video. In terms of the Amazon Prime production of The Wheel of Time, Madeline Madden has been cast to play Egwene. Now Madeline's a 23-year-old Australian actress best known for her work in the Dora and the Lost City of Gold movie. I have a casting video that I did on this when she was first cast, and I will link that in the description below if you want to see a more detailed breakdown on her past work. So what do you all think of Egwene? I know that we'll have a heated discussion about this in the comments, so absolutely let me know, but keep it civil. Please check out the Patreon as well. That is the absolute best way to support the channel. And with the website launching soon and the amount of time that we're spending here behind the scenes, not to mention the money that we're putting into it, my patrons are a lifesaver. You really keep this going. You can find the link in the description below. I seriously appreciate everybody who supports me at any amount. Uh, make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel if you want to see more content about the Wheel of Time. That's really what we do here. And thanks everybody for watching. Until next time, peace out. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do. Mistress up above, slipping on the rope of blue. She prances down the staircase, a fancy oh so free. Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?